brief overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, essentially transits and occultations of what you're going to see in the data and some definitions and so forth. Uh, then jumping into beyond that, which are phase curves, which are driven by reflectivity and emission. So if you have a planet and you go outside at nighttime and you see a bright dot in the sky that you know it's a planet, most of that light you're seeing from it is due to reflection coming from the star. And of course you can get emission coming from the planet as well, especially with these hot Jupiters that are very common now that everyone knows about. Uh, hot Jupiters, when you have temperatures around 2000 Kelvin, a significant flux from that black body is emitted in the optical range and you can see it glow. Uh, it's, it's along the same lines of when you take the ember out of the, out of the fireplace, it's glowing hot red. So that's the emission. Then I'll show you some data that's coming from Kepler, the observations of Kepler uh, 10b, uh, what we're seeing so far in the, ref in the transit, the occultation, and the phase curve, and then give you some brief uh, interpretation of it and uh, maybe some explanation of what you're seeing. And then I'm going to jump into the bottom because once I realize if I talk about it, I'm going to be done pretty quickly. Is there's some neat stuff I want to show you about using gas planets and rocky planets together, of using the reflection and emission where you can start to measure rotation of planets, especially when they have eccentric orbits, uh, and show you some neat movies of, uh, of modeling them. So let's start by putting everything into context, at least sizes and uh, sizes in terms of how big the objects are we're talking about and how far away they are from their host star. So Kepler 10b has a very short orbital period. So I see p equals 0.84 days. That means it takes only 20 hours for it to go around its, its host star. And the host star has a temperature around 5600 Kelvin, so it's a little bit cooler than the sun. Um, and that's actually the mass. It's 0.9 um, solar masses, and the radius is actually a little bit bigger than the sun. So this tells us that it's a, a star with a similar mass, but it's a little bit bigger, which means it's evolved. And in fact, we have astroseismology uh, results from the star where you can see it pulsate that tells us that this is essentially a more evolved version of the sun. Uh, the planet itself goes around every 20 hours, which means it's very close in, uh, thanks to the explanation from Kepler's third law. So it's only two one hundredths of an AU away from its host star. So to give you an idea of the scale of that, if you look at the plot on the right with the circles around it, uh, the white, or the white pinkish one is Mercury. The red one is HD 209458, which was the topic of my thesis, my PhD thesis, is why I have this plot made. But Kepler 10b is even closer into its host star than that. So in terms of stellar radii, 209458 is around three st stellar radii away from the surface of the star itself. So it's really close in, and it's just getting whomped with all the heat and energy that's coming off of it. Um, in terms of how hot it would be on the surface, we're talking temperatures around 2,000 Kelvin. So this is not the case where you hear about myths of going outside and breaking eggs on your driveway and watching them cook. In this case, you would be cooked as well, so <laughs> don't even try it. Uh, in terms of radius and size, the schematic that's on the left shows the not the distances, but the sizes of objects relative to each other. So in the talk today, I'm going to talk about objects as big as Jupiter all the way down to objects that are about the size of the Earth, a little bit bigger. But that's sort of the range of radii that we're dealing with, and masses that go from a few Earth masses, around five Earth masses, all the way up to hundreds to 300 uh, Earth masses. <coughs> so let's look at some terminology to give you in place of uh, a, a transit versus an occultation. So the uh, top animation is actually the transit of Venus going in front of, the, going in front of our Sun. So this is what Kepler is seeing, except not as a resolved image, but as a, essentially a single couple pixels of the light it all merged together. So as the planet moves in front of the star, there's a little bit of light that's blocked off. And it's all relative to the size of the star relative <coughs> to the planet. The occultation is when the planet is moving behind the star. So if you're operating a photometer and you don't have the resolution to resolve the two objects, you're seeing the light that's coming from the star combined with the light that's coming from the planet. So when the planet goes behind the star, you're now only seeing the light that's coming from the star. And that produces a drop in the flux that you're seeing overall. So the schematic on the bottom right shows you sort of an orbit uh, with the flux. So you see the deep transit uh, in front, followed by when the planet goes behind the star, there's a shallower drop in flux as well that we call the occultation. 
So transit is the planet moving in front of the star, and an occultation is the planet moving behind the star. And then while we're seeing light flux from the planet blocking off starlight and the star blocking off planet light, there is also the phase curve, which for planets is typically dominated by your day-night cycle. So, are we, so it's like looking at the moon. Are we seeing a full phase? Or are we seeing a crescent? Or is it a, a new moon sort of phase? And the amount of light that you see depends on how much of the illumination of the planet that you're seeing, which will then modulate the phase curve on top of it. So here's a, a typical transit that you might see. Uh, it's uh, at least the top right hand shows you. It's a planet moving across the star. You see a characteristic reduction in the light. Uh, the red is a, a model that includes the fact that a star is not an evenly uh, uh, luminous source. It has limb darkening across it, so you see the flux change across the surface. Uh, and that's included in the model. model. The bottom part shows you the simple case scenario, or if you had a flat, evenly illuminated disk with a dark planet moving across it, you get this sort of trapez trapezoidal shape. All the information that's built into that allows you to derive essentially three basic parameters. There's your transit depth, which is proportional to the radius of the planet and the star. So a bigger planet in front of a star blocks out more light. Uh, the transit duration, if you play around with Kepler's third law, is related to the mean stellar density of the host star. Uh, this is because, you, because of Kepler's third law, when you measure transit duration, you're measuring the orbital velocity of the planet during that part of the orbit. So you put together the orbital velocity together with the orbital separation. It actually allows you to get a geometrical measurement of the, trans of the stellar density of the host star. That's only if it's a circuit orbit. Um, and then thirdly, the egress-ingress, so the slopes that you see before and after transit, as related uh, mostly to the impact parameter. Are you going across the bottom of the star or are you going across the center? So you can incorporate all this together into a sophisticated model that allows you to pull these parameters out that allow you to characterize the planet and the host star simultaneously. The occultation is a measurement of the flux change when the planet goes behind the star. And this is heavily dependent on the bandpass that you're using. So this neat graphic that comes from a Spitzer press release uh, a while back uh, shows you the difference in the top of an optical occultation. So this is when you have the bright star with a dim planet going behind. Or if you go to the infrared, where suddenly you're seeing the, a lot of the flux from the glow of the planet going behind a subdued, darker star. Uh, so the depth of the occultation uh, is very dependent on the bandpass you're using. And I think that's a key point to keep in mind as I go through the slides and show you some of the results that we're seeing. Uh, what you see when you, me when you actually measure the depth, the depth itself gives you an estimate of the brightness temperature of the planet. So I use brightness instead of effective temperature because you're measuring the, uh, essentially the, the temperature that you see in a specific bandpass, which can change a lot depending if you're using optical or infrared. And then the duration and the phase will give you a measurement of the eccentricity of the orbit. Normally, if I do a phase curve from 0 to 1, you would see the transit at 0 and the occultation at 0.5. If that's the case, you know the orbit's likely to be circular. When it moves it around, that gives you an indication of how eccentric the orbit might be. Uh, for all the ones that we're measuring today, because they're so close in, is that you expect them to be circular. And then finally, you get the phase curve. The phase curve can be dominated by, well, it's mostly dominated by the day-night cycle when you're dealing with planets. But there are three effects uh, that you can commonly pull out with Jupiter-sized planets when observing a phase curve. So the phase curve is you take the data, fold it at the orbital period, and then bin it all together. So if it's a planet going around a star, you see the transit, and then the planet moves across, and you're seeing the dark side. And as the planet goes around, the star becomes more and more illuminated, so you're seeing more flux goes to the observer, so the flux continuously increases. So on the figure, at phase zero is the transit, and the pink curve shows you the phase, uh, phase plot that you would get for reflectivity. So as you move away from the transit and the planet becomes more illuminated, you see an increase in flux over time. There's two other neat effects that you see that produce different types of curves or at least out of phase. One, the first one is ellipsoidal variations. This is the planet has significant mass. It's going to distort the star, almost turn it into almost a football shape. 
So as the, as the football shape rotates, you see different profiles uh, facing towards you. In particular, you get an effect called gravity darkening, which changes the surface brightness of the star. So it appears brighter and dimmer at different phases, which are essentially mirrored uh, due to that football shape. So that's why you see in the blue curve, it's at twice the orbital period, um, which is different from what you see from the daylight cycle. And then the last one, which is a really cool effect, which is only really seen definitively with Kepler data, is Doppler boosting. This is a relativi relativistic effect of the star moving around the center of mass. So similar to radio velocities, when you see the star move away and from you, you see it moving blue when it goes towards you and red when it moves away from you. Rel with relativity, you also get a change in the amount of photons that reaches your eye when objects move quickly towards you or quickly away from you. So if I take a star and move it quickly towards you, you will actually see it appear brighter. And that's a consequence of the fixed speed of light. Uh, the photon rate will, be, uh, will, will increase because the arrival rate of photons is, is reaching you at an increased flux. Whereas if I take the star and move it away from you, that flux decreases. So the green curve mirrors what you would see from a radio velocity standpoint. Uh, so you can see on one part of the transit, the planet's moving towards you, and on the other side of the transit, the planet's moving away. And there's a question in the audience. What are the relative strengths of these effects? So the question is, what are the relative strengths of these effects? Uh, the relative strengths depends on the mass of the, of the planet, and it depends on the separation between the planet and the star. Tidal forces is a one over r, is a r cubed effect. So as you move away from the star, the, the effect diminishes quite quickly. Uh, Doppler boosting uh, depends on the mass, so it scales exactly as you expect from rate of velocity. And the day-night cycle is a one over r squared effect because it's, it's flux. So as you move farther away from the planet, there is less light that you're absorb less light that's hitting the planet uh, compared to all the compared to the entire sphere of, uh, of emission. So for something like a Jupiter-sized planet, you can get a day-night cycle that could be on the order of 50 to 100 parts per million. You can get ellipsoidal variations, which are like five parts per million, and Doppler boosting can be like one to ten parts per million. So we're talking tiny little numbers. There are cases where you actually have a white dwarf that's going around in a shorter orbital period, and because of the increased mass, the lipsoidal variations and the Doppler boosting are much, much larger, where it's like 1,000 to 10,000 parts per million, where it's very easy to see in the light curve. So with the phase curve, we can talk about what we're actually measuring. With the phase curve and occultation, we could talk about what we're actually measuring, which is the albedo. Uh, there are a couple definitions of albedo, but I'm going to stick with what's called the Bond albedo with a definition that dates all the way back to 1861, which talks about what is the bolometric uh, flux that's observed coming off the planet relative to the light that's hitting it. So bolometric means measured over all wavelengths, not just a single one. Um, and again, it's all incident angles. So can we integrate from every viewing angle of that planet or surface that we're looking at and then put it together to make the measurement? So that's the Bond albedo. Because we actually don't measure volumetrically, and it's hard to measure over all phase angles, is we break it up into two components that we actually observe. There's your geometric albedo, AG, and your phase integral. So these are the two observables that you go out to look at. The geometric albedo, by definition, is what is the brightness of the source you're looking at when it's directly, when it's fully illuminated, compared to the brightness of the star. And then the phase integral is how does that flux change, that ratio, as I look at it from different viewing angles? So if I look at the moon, for instance, uh, when you see it face on, it's actually a lot brighter than you might expect just from the geometric itself. Right? There's cratering on the surface and shadows and so forth that fill it in. So when you actually go look at a full moon, it appears a lot brighter than you might actually expect. And you can see it in the plot by looking at the gray line, which is the moon. So the dashed line is what you'd expect from geometry alone. And then the other colors are what you see from planets and planets and other objects in our solar system. So the moon, because it's, it's a much sharper rise when you go to zero, says that the flux increases a lot stronger when you go towards full illumination than you might expect uh, from ge geometry alone. So these two components together are what we actually observe. So geometric albedo is specific for the wavelength we're observing. And in the phase integral, which is usually the hardest thing to measure, gives you an idea of what the scattering is like across the surface. And we put these together to, to essentially get a definition for what we want for the Bond albedo. Of an interesting side effect, uh, or, or, or 
historical lesson is that when the Banda Albida was defined, it was thought of in sort of reflectivity, in that we never thought we would see emission coming from planets when we're looking at them, because Jupiter and our planet are so far away from their host star that the black body peak of emission is far outside the optical range. So when we look at planets ourselves in our solar system, we see optical emission. But now with the discovery of hot Jupiters and planets that are very close in is that the geometric albedo is a little bit more confusing. So let's jump into the Kepler mission, which I'm sure everyone here is, is well aware of. Um, it was designed to find Havel planets around solar-like stars, which means it continuously and simultaneously observed over 160,000 stars. And it did that for, was it four years and one day or something like that, where the primary mission was four years? Uh, so, you know, it's a success. <laughs> when I was asked on a radio, yeah, I was on a radio interview and someone asked me, uh, like, oh, so is it a success? I'm like, yes, you wanted four years, it gave you four years in one day. And he's like, well, it's like my dishwasher. As soon as the warranty goes, it breaks. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, we're all here because, in seeing these talks, because of the amazing results that Kepler has provided. It's a one meter Schmidt telescope, so it's an enormous telescope that's put into space away from all the artifacts of our atmosphere uh, to give you very clean photometry over very long time scales. It's over 100 square degrees field of view with originally 42 operating CCDs. And just as a, a note, there is a potential two-wheel extension that's in the works of can we get more data with this amazing instrument? And hopefully we'll find out soon. Uh, there was a neat graphic that showed up on space.com which I thought I would share. It gives you an idea of the scales involved with as Kepler as a survey instrument. On the left, you can see the scale of just how big the Kepler instrument is compared. For instance, the Hubble, which is a two and a half meter telescope, versus how big you and I are to scale. So Kepler is it's actually pretty big. It's an, it's an enormous telescope, and that's why the results have been so great. Uh, in terms of how much of the galaxy, or even in terms of the universe we're exploring, as usual, it's this tiny little sliver. Uh, all these great results from looking at just a little <coughs> tiny piece of sky, which by our instrumentation is large with 100 square degrees, but in terms of survey space, it's tiny. So on the top, you can see a schematic of our galaxy with a little tiny rectangle of our potential survey area. And then if you drill down into our local solar neighborhood, you can see we're going out around 3,000, 4,000 light years. Uh, in reality, we're only really serving out for Hubble zones maybe to a few hundred light years, to a thousand light years. Uh, so it's just really a, a drop in the bucket of the total uh, volume of discovery that's still awaiting us out there. Uh, Kepler is, it looks up in a nighttime sky between Vega and Cygnus. So if you go out tonight, actually, and you find Vega and Cygnus so in, the, in the summer triangle, you can put your hand up and figure out where the Kepler field of view is. Or if you don't know the nighttime sky, download that cell phone app that allows you to look around. <laughs> but, uh, this is actually a fairly easy one to find. So. And then the photo on the right is actually a picture of Kepler from launch. Uh, this is from Cape Canaveral back in 2009. So it's the, the, the rocket going up into the atmosphere and then going into orbit. It's not going up and crashing down into the sky. That's just your perspective of how you're watching it. And then the glows, the little yellow ambers that you're seeing come down are the expended boosters coming down afterwards. And those little specks behind it are actually stars that you can see Kepler launching off into them. And one of them, I always forget which one, is Tau Botus, which is an exoplanet hosting star. So right now, this is the sample that I'm going to use for the rest of the talk, which is the Kepler candidates quarter one through quarter eight. There are over 3,000 candidates, even a lot more now, which if you pay attention for when the Kepler Science Conference comes up in November, you'll get the latest updates of how the reductions and uh, what new findings are coming out of the Kepler light curves. But for now, you can see there's just a massive database of planets for which we can search for occultations and phase <coughs> curves and trans, well, transits, obviously, uh, but the occultations and phase curves and do some interesting science with. So there's 350 Earth-sized ones over a thousand Neptune sized objects which are two to six Earth radii. Um, it's just a real plethora of objects. And I'm going to talk about one object which is in the 351 bin, so the, the cyan group, and then I'm going to talk about a couple other ones that are in the 202 uh, Jupiter sized range objects and show you some interesting results from those. Usually when you go to a Kepler talk, this is a slide everyone concentrates on. It's the 
size of the planet versus equilibrium because you want to see lots of dots that are around 300 Kelvin at one Earth radii, around 250 Kelvin at uh, one Earth radii. Um, but I'm actually not that interested in that for this talk. I'm interested in the other extreme of these ones that are at 2,000 Kelvin, how many of them are small, how many are Jupiter, and can we actually see emitted and reflected light from these planets because they're so close into their host star. So I'm going to take that same plot, and now I'm just going to arbitrarily break them up uh, by the size of the planet. So the red ones are your essentially Jupiter-sized planets. They're 7 to 10 times the size of the Earth. Uh, the green ones are your potential Neptune-sized class planets, 2 to 7 Earth radii. Again, these classes are arbitrary, so don't hold me to them for definitions. And then finally, black is what I consider small. Uh, it's going to be anything that's under 2 Earth radii. And you can see that even with the smallest ones of 2 Earth radii, there are a lot of candidates that have temperatures between 1,500 and 2,000 Kelvin. Next thing I can do is I can go through all of these light curves and now start searching for occultations. So I see the flux that's coming as a time series, and I see the dip that's coming from the transit over time. And so now I'm going to look away from the transit and say, is there any other periodic dips that happen at the same period? Um, do I see an occultation? So I can search through all the phase angles for the strongest event, whether it be positive or negative, and then plot those. So the figure shows the equilibrium temperature, so the expected temperature of the planet if it's a black body uh, illuminated by the star. So it goes from around 500 Kelvin all the way up to 3,000 Kelvin. And then I've plotted the depth of the occultation in parts per million uh, along with that. So you can see it's scattered mostly around zero because a lot of the events are very noisy. We don't expect to find thousands of occultations because it's a small single and because you have to be close in. So you only expect to find tens of these type of events. Uh, <coughs> But what I've done is I've taken the largest ones, so these ones that are 7 to 10, 7 to 10, uh, or basically bigger than 7 Earth radii, and plotted them in red. And what you can see with the red points is once you go above around 1,100 Kelvin, above around 1,000 Kelvin, a majority of those red points are above the zero line. That's telling me, on average, I am detecting occultations from Jupiters, a whole bunch of them, uh, <coughs> in the Kepler-like curves. You know, there's a good dozen or so, even more, that are being detected. And on top of that, there's a couple black points that are scattered systematically above that zero line, which says, I'm also finding occultations of smaller planets. So I can take those occultations and I can plot, let's just give me only the ones that have a detection greater than 2 sigma. So at the sort of the 90 percentile, so there's going to be obviously a, a 1 in 10 here won't be right, uh, but overall, the statistics don't work. And I've taken the same designation, so black is small, green is sort of medium sized, and red is your largest <coughs> ones, and plotted them again and saying, what am I seeing? Again, you see small objects with non-zero occultations uh, from anywhere from 1,000 Kelvin outwards. A lot of these are going to be blended eclipsing binaries because the occultation depth is too great for what you might expect from a planet. And this is a way that uh, the Kepler mission actually uses the data to weed out non-planetary events by looking for occultations. But at the same time, you can also get some interesting science. So what I can do is I can take that occultation depth and translate it into the observable, which is the geometric albedo. So this is a geometric albedo observed over the Kepler band pass, which may include emission from the planet as well. So the equation is essentially the ratio of the, of the flux coming from the planet divided by the flux coming from the star. So that's the depth of the occultation that you're measuring compared to the distance from the star, which is A, to the radius of the planet. And that term gives you AG, which is the uh, geometric albedo. So any time that I, well, I run the numbers, use all the uncertainties from the radius of the planet, and ask, which ones do I have a detection of the geometric albedo that's better than 30%, so my, at 0.3, and plot only those. This plot is dominated by, obviously, red objects. These are the Jupiter ones for which we're detecting occultations and seeing emitted and reflected light from the planet. As expected, because they're the biggest, they're going to have the biggest surface area to reflect and emit light back toward the observer. But on top of that, there's green and black points that are also coming into the sample. These are the ones where it's neptune size and earth size planets where I'm actually now detecting emitted or reflected light from smaller planets. But before I get too crazy in that, I have to go one step back 
and talk about the band paths, which I alluded to earlier. Geometric albedos and phase curves and occultations are dependent on the band paths that you're using. So the figure shows from 400 to 900 nanometers uh, the band passes of a couple space instruments. In particular, I've plotted Kepler, which you all know about, Corot, which was a, a French mission uh, that's uh, now elapsed, and then my PhD project, which is most and actually still running just fine, uh, <coughs> as another band pass on top of it. They're all very wide, essentially white light band passes. Uh, then I've plotted two model spectra on top of it. There's a M2V, so a small M star model spectra that's put there, and then a hot A star in the cyan. Hopefully you can see okay towards the back on top of it. And they've been scaled so that they have equal flux in a Johnson V band filter. And the Johnson filters, the B, V, R, and I, are plotted on top of it to give you an idea of what those types of uh, band passes are. So what this tells you is that for an M2, uh, M, for an M star, which is going to be around 3,500 Kelvin, 4,000 Kelvin, there is significant flux which leaks into the Kepler bandpass, uh, as opposed to a star, <coughs> which will have a significant amount of flux in the Kepler bandpass. So if I were to observe the same planet, say with a B filter, the thermal emission from the planet would be heavily suppressed because most of that's coming in the red end of the spectrum. But because, because the Kepler bandpass is so wide, we see a significant amount of potential emission coming from these planets. If you turn that into uh, black body plots, so the figure here shows wavelength on the bottom versus the amount of flux that's coming from the objects, where the sun is on the top represented as a black body, and then we have Jupiter, Venus, Earth, and Mars seen from a distant observer and what they would see. And it's a double humped curve that you see. The curve to the right is the emission, the black body emission that you're seeing. And the hump to the left is a mirror of the star. So how much light is reflected based on how big that object is. So Jupiter is the biggest, so you see the most, reflect, most flux coming from it due to reflection. But what it tells you is that if I observe in the optical range with a very specific filter, my flux from the planet is dominated by the optical, where if I observe in the infrared, I'm dominated from emission by the planet. So what I can do is I can say, well, what sort of fluxes do I potentially observe in the Kepler bandpass depending on how hot the planet is? So I know how big the Kepler bandpass is. I have an idea how big these planets are. So I'm going to change the temperature of it. So I go here from a 1,000 to 2,000 Kelvin. And just assume everything is black bodies. Now much, how much thermal flux leaks into the Kepler bandpass as a function of temperature? This is for a Jupiter-sized planet. And you can see up at uh, 2,000 Kelvin, we're getting about 10 parts per million or even a little bit more. And it can actually be significantly more than this, uh, depending on how you model the spectra <coughs> of, of the star and planet. And then also, I can say, well, how hot? Um, so based on this, it's, uh, which ones do I expect to see based on thermal emission? And it's the ones that are closer in. So the plot on the right shows you the equilibrium temperature. So how hot do I expect the planet to be versus how close it is to the star? So once we get into about 4 one hundredth, 2 one hundredth of an AU, we get about above around 1,500 Kelvin, which means we're in a regime where you can actually detect an emitted flux from a planet. So I can take the measurements that come from Kepler. So these are all these geometric albedos. And then say, how much thermal contribution do I expect to, become, uh, to be introduced here based on different assumptions? So the bottom curve shows you the thermal contribution for a Jupiter-sized planet around a solar-like star. So it could be finally small. Whereas if it's a Jupiter around an M star, that can be significantly larger because the flux coming from the M star is a lot less, which means I expect the flux from the planet to be smaller as well. Uh, it just means that if I take the geometric albedo, you have to remember it's a combination of reflectivity and admission. So let's look at Kepler 41b, KOI 196, uh, which shows a beautiful occultation and phase curve. The top panel shows you the time series from Kepler. So there's, in this case, around 800 days of data is plotted here. The big black bl uh, blur at the top is out of transit data, and all the lines coming down are the repeated transits that you're seeing in the data, so it's very clear. The bottom panel shows you the data phased at the orbital period, uh, with the red one showing the transit first, so the data centered on the transit, 
and then I rotate it by 0.5 in phase, and now I can show you the occultation. So you can see in green, there's the occultation which dips down, which has been multiplied by a factor of 50 to show it clear, and then this phase curve that goes around it. And this is exactly what I was showing you earlier, what you would expect from reflectivity to a planet doing the phase curves. <coughs> you see the occultation, the drops, the amount of uh, flux that's blocked out by the star as the planet goes behind it. And then you see the modulation, so the sort of sinusoidal curve that you see, of going through the phase changes of the planet itself. In terms of turning that into numbers, you get an equilibrium temperature around 1400 Kelvin, which turns into a geometric albedo around 20%. This is a case where we actually have a reflective planet. You can go ahead and look at KOI 1, or trace 2, and do the same sort of uh, results. And I've plotted the same way. So on the bottom, you see the red is the transit, and the green is where the occultation and phase curve are. And now it's a lot smaller. The levels have dropped dramatically. In fact, you get an equilibrium temperature, which is similar, around 1400 Kelvin, but the albedo itself has dropped down to 2% or maybe even lower. So this is a case of a non-reflective planet. This is something that's probably darker than coal. So it's showing you that Jupiter's, hot Jupiter's come in a whole range of, uh, of characteristics, at least in their atmospheres, uh, specifically for reflectivity. A question from the audience? Describe that top right uh, diagram just a little bit more. It's got gaps in it. Sure. So the question was to describe the top right panel with the gaps in it. So Kepler was observing just fine. So it's, you're supposed to get continual uh, observations. But then one of the detectors died on board. So Kepler rotates to keep its solar panels pointed towards the observer, uh, sorry, towards the sun so it can stay powered. So every three months, there's a rotation. And the field of view rotates as well. So if there's a missing gap in the detector, every fourth quarter, you're not going to observe that target anymore. So this just tells you that KOY1 or trace 2 was on a, a part of the field of view that's missing data every fourth quarter. And now, you can see the same thing here. So here's Kepler-10b. On uh, the top right is the data spanning almost 900 to 1,000 days. And you can see there's two gaps in there as well, to the same effect. <coughs> and there's the black line and then the blur of lines of dots going down below it, which are the repeated transits that are happening every 20 hours. So I take the same data, phase it and bin it up, and that's in the red and green. I've taken the green curve and multiplied it by a factor of 100, just to put things in perspective and allow you to see the scales and the, the size of the transit, which is you know 1,000 parts per million, versus this occultation here, which is 10 parts per million. So we're detecting a light change of significant singleton noise here of 10 parts per million. And I can turn that into the same numbers. So this is an equilibrium temperature around 2,000 Kelvin. And in terms of geometric albedo, it's around 0.5. And the obvious question is, are we seeing reflectivity coming from the planet? Or is this emission from the planet? And that's what I'm going to try to get at into a little bit. But the first thing I want to show you is this part of the light curve. Your green line is sort of what you expect from your ideal case, your sort of isotropic reflector. Uh, and you can see that all the data points that are on the right in that little circle are above the green line. There is a significant asymmetry in this light curve than what you might expect. Uh, this is telling me that as I see the planet going through its phase changes, one hemisphere looks to be a lot brighter than the other. So can we figure out what's actually producing this? So I can turn this into a phase curve brightness map. This is where I assume that everything that we're seeing is due to reflectivity or emission straight from the surface without a, without a cause of it, and ask if I had eyes that only could see in the Kepler bandpass, what would I see? So in order to turn that phase curve into a map, is I put letters across it. So you start out with the transit, which is at A, and you go through phase changes at B, where you disappear behind the star at point C, and then go through other phase changes towards D and then back to A. So I can put that on a map where I go from the eastern hemisphere uh, to the western hemisphere. So you start by seeing the western hemisphere first, so you can think about a globe if you're rotating in front of you, and then put that into a simple map that's shown as the red blob down there. And this just puts equal, essentially at each longitude, you're just putting the, the, the same flux, but dictated by how uh, high the amplitude is from the phase curve. And what we learned from this, as I said earlier, is that the Western Hemisphere is the brightest. 
So let's try to explain while we're seeing this. You might say, well, that's easy to do. You just put a little bit of eccentricity into the orbit. So as the planet gets closer to the star and further away due to an eccentric orbit, the amount of flux hitting it is going to be modulated over time. Well, I can immediately rule that out because, as I told you earlier, the occultation is a measurement of the eccentricity of the orbit. We see it exactly at, p at phase 0.5 offset from the transit, and the duration is the same as the transit. So that says that the orbit is very close to zero. You can do the measurements, and it's less than about 0.1%. So it's very circular. And at that range of eccentricity, there's no way to produce that asymmetry I showed you in the phase curve earlier. The second thing I do is I can get more involved. Let's make a simple thermal model. So this thermal model is going to take essentially a rocky planet, and I'm going to go down about 100 meters depth into it and give it properties that are similar to the Earth. So the Earth's material is, you know, we can actually dig some of it up and we can take samples of it and we can try to measure it in labs and compress it and heat it up and so forth to try to measure properties such as the thermal conductivity. And I can take those measurements and put it into a simple model. The model f is a surface, again, 100 meters deep. You radiate it. So how, well, so how much light do I reflect and how do I radiate it throughout the surface? That's essentially your albedo. Uh, SA is a surface area, in case you're asking on there. Uh, so I radiate the surface over the, night, over the day side <coughs> and allow that to essentially sink in. Uh, so I radiate the surface and I radiate the black body throughout the interior. So this is essentially diffusion at, at work. Um, then I have conduction. So how well does this material conduct heat into its surface for hold, uh, to get it deep in there? And then finally, heat capacity of how well can I store the energy and hold on to it? So it's, it's essentially a very simple model. You can put it as a grid together. Each cube that you have in this model absorbs a bit of light and then it directs it around to its neighbors and distributes it. And I can play with those models and try to reproduce the phase curve. So the two free vari variables here end up being, well, three actually, is one is the reflection, which will dict dictate the overall amplitude of the flux that you're seeing, and then rotation and obliquity. So if I spin the planet, <coughs> then that flux is going to be transported from the day side to night side, where it then emits the flux back out into space. Right? Whereas if it's tidally locked and always facing towards the host star, it just heats up till it reaches equilibrium temperature. So the blue, so the blue plot shows no rotation, so it's perfectly s symmetrical, which is not what we're seeing in the observations. So I can go ahead and add rotation to it. I can spin in a prograde rotation like we are here on the Earth, or I can spin it in a retrograde rotation, and that will spread the flux out in different directions. So uh, <coughs> as you spin away from the star, that surface point, it's going to radiate into space. And that rate at which it radiates outward is going to be determined by the physical properties I put into my model earlier. So it's essentially Earth material of how well does it maintain that energy as it rotates around. So at a rocky surface, it's actually not very good, uh, which means I actually have to put quite a lot of spin into it to start producing these asymmetries. So you can see the red curve is a retrograde rotation where I put in a rotation period of around four hours. And in the prograde rotation in the opposite direction, I think I put about 10 hours in there. But again, the observations would suggest that the retrograde rotation is a better match to the observations I'm seeing at hand. Of course, anyone in the audience that deals with short orbital planets is going to say, you're crazy because there's a thing called uh, tidal locking. And that Everyone expects these planets, when they're really close into their host stars, to have orbital periods that's matched directly to the orbital, the orbital spin matched to the orbital period. So I don't believe this at all. Well, that's fine. I'm just putting out a suggestion. I can match the observations by doing this. And then the last thing I could do is I can actually add obliquity to it. So rather than having the orientation of the spin of the planet and the spin of the star being aligned, if I take the planet and tilt it, it's going to go around the, the star with that same tilt, uh, which will also produce an asymmetry in the curve. And I can choose the angle and the phase at which that angle points and also produce an asymm asymmetry uh, <coughs> in this curve that matches what you see in the observations. So if I say this is all thermal, this is due to dynamics of the, of the uh, sort of spin and uh, period of the planet, is I can reproduce the observations OK. But of course, the simplest answer is to go back to the first one, which is just to say this is all just due to different markings on the surface of the planet itself. 
which I just say there's something on the Western Hemisphere which appears to be brighter than something on the, the, the Eastern Hemisphere. When you think about something that's tidally locked in orbit, as it goes through its orbit, it's sort of smashing into all the solar wind and everything else and particles that you go through it. So you might think that one hemisphere is more pop-marked than the other one. And just like when you see the moon coming at full phase, when you see it fully illuminated, it appears to be brighter. It could be something very similar we're seeing on this distant planet with sort of cratering activity, or even just surface markings due to materials going through, which is causing us to see it brighter in one hemisphere than the other. But I kind of like playing with these obliquity and retro rotation things just for fun. Because in the future, we're going to have JWST, an infrared instrument, which will, as I was going on and on and on about earlier about observing at different wavelengths, will allow us to tell the difference between emission and reflectivity. So if I see that all this is being caused by emission from the surface when I observe in infrared, I see the same asymmetry then suddenly these retro rotation and obliquity models come back into play because I have to explain how to transport that emission from the day side towards the night side in a, uh, in a specific direction. So that's Kepler-10v. So to finish off next, I want to take these same models and now jump into measuring rotation periods of eccentric planets. And these are types of objects which I'm just sort of waiting to pop out of the Kepler data. They're probably, we probably have already discovered them, but we just need to get measurements of their eccentricity, maybe from radial velocities, uh, which I think that for eccentric planets, we can use these sort of same tricks with the phase curves to determine the rotation period. So I can take a simple model, which is uh, Navier-Stokes for single layer fluids. This is your shallow water approximation. So it's, it's essentially I take a solid sphere and put a bit of water around it or just one single layer of fluid and then radiate one side of it and watch the dynamics as I spin it. And you get these really cool movies that comes out of it. So, so in terms of planet rotation, <coughs> if it's a short orbital period and you're close in, you expect to be tidally locked. But if I add eccentricity, it can't be tidally locked anymore because the amount of torque that's induced on the planet as it goes through periastron and abstron is going to change. And in fact, there's a bunch of theories in place that predict what the orbital period of the planet is compared, the rotation period of the planet compared to its orbital period as a function of eccentricity. So there's a Hugh 1981 uh, prediction, for instance, that gives the relationship between the ratio of the rotation period and orbital period versus eccentricity. Uh, so I can throw this into the model I'm using earlier and start producing synthetic light curves and predictions. So first of all, I can show you an eccentric planet that we know exists. This is HD 80606b, uh, which I've taken a nice animation from Greg Laughlin here, which shows to scale the orbit of the planet around the star. So you can see the size of the star down there by that little blue disk with the planet going around it, with the little tiny dot showing you to scale the size of the planet. So this is one of those cases where putting planetary dynamics on scale on a screen actually helps make sense of all of it. And that big event that you might have missed, though, you'll get to see it again, is the model showing it starts out far away from the planet, so as far away as you can get, so it's uh, about, I think it's around 0.5 AUs, uh, going around in a 100-day orbit. And as it gets close in, suddenly it reaches a point where it's getting only like couple stellar radii from the whole surface, and the whole planet atmosphere just gets lumped with all the flux that hits it. So you can imagine it's all happy and the atmosphere is doing its thing like Jupiter might be, and then all this energy gets deposited into the atmosphere and produces a great big hot spot that goes off. So let's see. Can I show it again? Where are we? I think it's going to happen soon. Patience. <laughs> but as you can see for this one, it, it's, it's mostly benign for most of its, ob for most of its orbit. And it, <clears throat> Again, it only takes a few days, only takes like a couple days where it goes in where the atmosphere gets flash heated and then as it moves away it's going to radiate this heat away and go back towards uh, its normal equilibrium temperature far away from the planet. Here it comes. Splash. Splash. <laughs> so because of it's rotating and you have this hot spot that's sort of dominated on it is you can turn that into predictions of what you might see. So the plot on the right shows you the temperature as a function of time. Uh, and this is the temperature of the surface that you would observe uh, looking from, say, the Earth. So you only see one, surf one part of the planet at a time. 
the part that's facing towards you. So you see a day side, hot side, and a dark side. You see the hot side, which was flash heated, so you get this hot spot. And then you see the night side, and you see that rotation as it moves away. So it's heavily modulated as time. And then you have this overall decay rate as the planet returns back to its normal equilibrium. And you can turn that into a flux ratio, as you might see from the Kepler field of view. So if HD80806 HD B was observed by Kepler, we would easily see this very cool signature in the data. It's a very bright target on top of it. And the spacing between those bumps essentially tells you what the rotation period of the planet is. And a decay pattern tells you about the heat capacity and all sorts of other interesting physics about the atmosphere itself. So I actually went and tried to get observations of this with MOST, which is a 15 centimeter uh, size optic space telescope. And that's the blue lines, the blue dots. The red is the model. As you can see, I did, didn't have enough observations to be able to measure that. But nonetheless, it's an effect that I expect to show up at some point. The green curve shows you the distance in the convenient unit of deci AU as a function of time. Because deci AU equals millimagnitudes on the same scale here. So. Uh, so you can go ahead and play with these models and try all sorts of different orbital configurations. I can take something very close in and say maybe it has an eccentricity of 0.3 or something. So you get these hot spot that's moving across the surface as it's rotating that you can then turn into a temperature plot and a flux plot in parts per million. You get these very specific looking phase curves that you can start pulling out of the data. Um, just all sorts of neat, fun things you can play with. And again, it makes the really cool movies. This is a temperature plot. And then lastly is I can take this sort of rock model I talked about earlier uh, versus, say, an atmosphere model. The rock model, which bare surface has a hard time holding on to the heat that it's collected versus an atmosphere which has a, can do a very good job of both uh, having good heat capacity and trend and then also spreading the flux out because of flows because you have a moving fluid essentially across the surface is the top one shows you what I might see of a uh, surface plot of the brightness of temperature for a rock versus the bottom one if I put a gaseous atmosphere around it and if it is rotating the Two plots, the red versus the green, show you the different predictions based on red being a rocky model versus green being a planet with an atmosphere. Uh, so if we can start seeing hot Kepler 10b objects with a little bit of eccentricity, they're getting flash heated as they go across their surface, we can quickly ask, do they have atmospheres and do they actually measure these? And it's only a matter of time before we start finding these things. I think if one thing that Kepler has taught us is that if you can imagine like a type of planet, it's out there somewhere. So to summarize, Kepler-10b is it's the first time we've detected light from a rocky world. And it's giving us our first insight in towards characterizing the surface of a rocky planet. You know, we're at our first beginning stages. We have a single band pass measurement. So there's degeneracies. Is it emission? Is it reflection? Uh, as future instrumentation goes online, such as JWST and other infrared, measurement, other infrared facilities, we can start to get your poor man's first spectrum, which is two colors and hopefully start breaking these degeneracies. <clears throat> and then secondly is that I think this data exists in Kepler. It's just a matter of time before we tease out the details. Is eccentric giant planets have the potential to be really cool, uh, or say hot, physical laboratories for measuring atmospheric properties, uh, in particular things like heat capacity. And you can also probably get into tidal forcing and so forth. Um, and I'm just, you know, just waiting for them to fall out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on that, I think I'm going to end. I think time's all right, and I'll take any questions if you have any. Um, Jason, if I could start off with the questions. Um, <coughs> what, uh, do we have any other examples of uh, rocky planets like Kepler-10b that are waiting to be announced. I guess if they were waiting to be announced, you wouldn't want to tell us about them. But um, what, what so sort of uh, com uh, companions might be uh, in the Kepler data set? For so there's at least one, maybe two other candidates that are in the Kepler data set that are small and probably show an occultation. They're fainter, so we don't have the same signal to noise to detect the occultation and phase curve. But nonetheless, it's, they're, they're probably there as I haven't looked at them with a the full four years of data yet um, to see what they actually look like. So they won't be the same level as Kepler-10b, because Kepler-10b is a tenth magnitude star. 
These other candidates are like 12th and 13th magnitudes that are much fainter, so it's just harder to dig the data out. But I think there'll be more. And then of course, there's future test mission, which may show even more of these, because you're going through a larger volume of stars concentrating on short orbital periods. Right, OK. And, and what's the field of view of the most mission two as well? Does that look at the same part of the sky as Kepler? So most is a little more dynamic. Uh, most is a microsat. Uh, it's, the whole instrument is literally this big. So I can use the word literal. Um, and I said the optics are 15 centimeters. And it was launched in 2006 and still kicking strong. And it uh, has a five, five arc minute field of view. And you can point just about anywhere except for some limits based on where the sun is. And it also is in orbit around the Earth. So there are certain types, types so certain places you can't aim because the sun's in the way or the Earth's in the way. But uh, it's a little more dynamic. So you, you have a lot of uh, latitude of pointing around. But it's a smaller aperture. Jason, I'm here. Thank you for this talk, very good. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more for the, about the potential of JWST to um, characterize this, these and it was uh, launched specific in exoplanet, the one for which we detect mid-infrared emission? What kind of experiment do you envision, for instance? I, um, so, the, the, so I guess the question is, what is JWST going to tell us? Right. Um, the simplest way is as probably just photometry as your first step. Just an integrated photometry, whether that's a spectra and then summing it up over a specific band pass. It's just time series measurements of the brightness of the star and planet together uh, to show modulation. In particular, how deep is that occultation? Right, so when I showed a plot earlier of the black body curves of the star to planet flux ratio, you know, it depends, the amount of flux that you see in the infrared depends a lot on the brightness temperature of the planet in the infrared. And so a measurement of how bright we see it in the infrared gives you an overall um, estimate of what the temperature of the planet really is. And then you can use that to estimate how much flux I should be subtracting out of my optical band estimate to say what is the residuals left over and are those residuals strong enough to be something that's reflectivity. So right now, when I look in the optical band, it's a combination of two effects. There's your tail end of the black body emission, and then there's your peak of the reflectivity that are combined together, and I can't tell the difference. But if I have an instrument that's, if I have a measurement that's slightly towards the red, that says there's strong thermal emission, then I can estimate how much I have to subtract away from my optical measurement to then look at the residuals for the reflectivity. At least that's the first step. I was thinking about something a little bit more like characterizing the planet itself, like measuring, for instance, the composition, of the thermal inertia. Would it, would it be possible to do something like this as well? Uh, it's make a question. So, so uh, did you say thermal? The thermal inertia of the planet itself, because you will see the planet tilting. Right. Heat, how the heat basically varies on the surface of the planet. Yeah, so the question is, can I see uh, how the temperature varies across the surface of a planet? Well, the answer is yes. Right? Um, because you're observed, because the planet is going through all its different phase changes, is we're observing the day-night followed by the night side. So you have an observation, depending when you observe during the phase, of seeing the planet, seeing the different surfaces of the planet pointed towards the observer. So if you can get a continual observation with high signal to noise over 20 hours, uh, then you can reproduce how hot, you can reproduce a surface uh, temperature diet plot, essentially. <laughs> That's what we do for asteroids. Yeah. Hi, Jason. I've got a quick question. Um, what's the longest orbital period for which there's a detected occultation? So what's the longest orbital period for where there's a detected occultation? I'm not sure it is top of my head, but it's going to be on the order of five to 10 days, somewhere in that time scale, not much longer than that. I'd be surprised if it's even 10 days. <laughs> so Jason, <coughs> there's really nothing that precludes there being an atmosphere, mm -hmm. right? So just to take you to task a little bit, you don't know that you're seeing <laughs> a rocky world, right? Yes. Yeah, so the, I made the strong assumption that there is no atmosphere on this planet. So I made a very simple model, just a bare surface. But this is a very dense planet, so it's going to be a high surface gravity. So it could be maintaining some sort of atmosphere that would help with uh, driving flow. 
My only uh, rebuttal to that is if I take Coriolis forces alone with an atmosphere, the asymmetry goes in the wrong direction. So somehow you still got to move it in the wrong direction to get it back. So there's still ways to play with it. But I completely agree that uh, just using a bare surface is uh, not, you should go a little bit further than that. I wanted to ask about uh, how you're deducing some of this material about the surface heating and the atmosphere and so on. Because after all, when you started this, this talk, you said there are three different effects that we would expect to see. We would expect to see the, the star uh, change its brightness because of a distortion. We would expect to see uh, Doppler boosting. All of those processes occur. And so you've got to subtract them out before you have the residual for which you are using to deduce this, uh, this information. Yeah. Are you finding that, in fact, the residual allows you to make reliable estimates of whether it has an atmosphere or whether the heating is uniform or anything else about the planet? So the question is, uh, in one of the earlier slides, I I've talked about effects such as lipsoidal variations and <coughs> Doppler boosting. Uh, the nice thing about Kepler-10b is that it's a well-characterized system. I know the mass of the star very well from astroseismology. I know the mass of the planet very well because we have these beautiful radial velocity curves that uh, you're well aware of that come from, uh, from Keck. So I know the mass of both objects, and I know the orbital separation because I know the period exquisitely well. Uh, so that separation allows me to predict how strong would the amplitude be from ellipsoidal variations and how strong would the amplitude be from Doppler boosting. For a Jupiter-sized planet, the answer is it's going to be strong. I would definitely see it. And in the case of objects like Trace, uh, Trace 2, you can see it with significance. With a mass of Kepler-10b, which is 300 times less, so you're talking 100 times less, so it's only, what is it, five, four Earth masses. Uh, the amplitudes of ellipsoidal variations and Doppler boosting are about one part in 10 to the 7, so about 0 0.1 parts per million, which is below our detection limit here for these types of sources. Um, other things you might think of, well, maybe the star is variable or something like that. Uh, there is a chance that maybe there's an interaction between the planet and the star. We see these with other types of objects. There's a Tau Bodis, which I alluded to very briefly earlier. Uh, there's a magnetic interaction between the surface of the star and the planet itself, so which produces spots that sort of follow the planet as it goes around. So that you could have that embedded in here as well uh, that would produce an asymmetry in the light curve that you're seeing it. Um, I don't really see any strong evidence for it now, but I'm not going to rule it out completely. Um, in instead, what I was looking at is treating it as coming directly from the planets. This is a, a light source from the planet and looking at some simple ways of trying to explain the uh, asymmetry that we see. I think you also see obliquity and other things that you were scaling. Yeah. And those are completely arbitrary. Uh, I just sort of, uh, one th I, t I don't think I made this point clear at all, is that the phase curve, because it's on the Western Hemisphere, is sort of the opposite than what you might naively expect from rotation. So we have Coriolis effect, and even if it's tidally locked, it's going to have essentially a prograde rotation. And that's going to move, on average, energy with a flow towards the eastern hemisphere. So I would expect the asymmetry to be different, to be the opposite of what we actually observed. So because I'm seeing the opposite, as I started coming up with other ways of producing the flow going the other way. So the two ways I could think to be able to do that was one was to introduce a retrograde rotation, so very rapid four-hour rotation to essentially use, well, Coriolis can no flows, but essentially to move the heat in the other direction, to have the hot spot moving in general. Um, also to use just a general obliquity uh, to also have a hot spot on one hemisphere that would, sometimes the northern hemisphere gets all the heat and then sometimes it doesn't. So to do the sort of same sort of thing. So it was, just, it was two ways of trying to produce the observations without sort of a theorist view, uh, without having concrete evidence that either of these actually really exist. Yes. Um, it would seem that, I think you showed in one of the slides, that the uh, surface temperature is like 2,000 Kelvin. So it seems to me it's all molten if it's made out of Earth-like material. So mm -hmm. if it is tightly locked, would one side be solid, more or less, and the other side uh, basically like red lava? It's quite possible. Um, the night side is going to be relatively cool, uh, just because 
how do you take all this heat and then thermally conduct it all the way to the night side? Yeah. You look at Mercury and the contrast between the day side and night side, or even the moon, is quite large. So something saying it's molten on one side and rocky on the other side is, is possible. I can't really say much about it because I haven't thought too deeply into it. So did I understand correctly that <coughs> your leading hypothesis for Kepler 10b is that the leading hemisphere is getting um, deposits of dust on it and is making it darker? Uh, I think that's just a, another crazy way of producing this, right? Or but maybe less crazy, but. but. Wouldn't that generate an asymmetry opposite of what uh, you're observing? Because it's the leading hemisphere that's brighter? Uh, sure. You know, I'm just saying that so. I was just sort of speculating that if it's tidally locked and there's material coming and you're getting hit by material, you could potentially have it preferentially on one side. Sure. But and the leading hemisphere would be darker in that case. Well, not necessarily. It all depends on what you're removing from the surface and what you're doing. Okay. Um, it's not immediately clear that uh, it should move in that direction. I see. So you're saying that the dust could, be, could have a, a higher albedo than the planet. It doesn't take much. Really. Okay. So I think th in terms of albedo changes, we're talking only a few percent here. Just the effect of more impact craters on one side, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. I was just wondering if you could tell us a little more about your uh, fabulous uh, modeling techniques that you must have uh, okay. underneath um, these. So about the modeling techniques. So there's two different models I presented here. One was the uh, sort of rocky bare surface. So you just essentially take a sphere, break it up into a grid, and then each of those grid points, you have different effects that apply to it, which then communicate to their neighbors. Right? So you can make that grid as fine as you like, but it needs to be driven by your computational resources. So I run it on my laptop, so this is why I picked a set of coarse grid allowed to run to get the uh, general observations I want. Because it's first order, and that I'm looking for, is this hemisphere uh, brighter than, say, the other side, is it really doesn't take much resolution to do that. And I want to have a little bit of depth in there just to make sure I'm getting the maximum heat capacity that matters. And then I let it run for as long as possible till it just stop changing. So. <laughs> is this off-the-shelf software? Oh, no, no, I wrote it all myself. And then the second one is a, a shallow model approximation, which has been solved many times. Uh, uh, so it actually uses different Fourier techniques to reconstruct the surface in Fourier domains. So you can, if you look at the equations for Navier Stokes, there's a pole when you get to the southern and northern hemisphere that you have to deal with. So if you switch to a Fourier domain, you can deal with the poles uh, properly and then produce the integrations of the flows that you're seeing. So, and that's all sort of written software too. So it's just Fun stuff to play with. <laughs> Keeps the long weekends interesting. <laughs> Hi. A uh, quick clarification and then a real question. Okay. The clarification is the planet you talked about at the end, 80606, was that a, a rocky planet or a gas giant or something That's in between? a gas giant. I didn't okay. say that. It's a Jupiter-sized planet in about a 100-day orbit. And it's observed to actually transit. So. Cool. Yeah. OK, so my real question is, uh, do any of do you 